So I am just, I am just so thrilled. I can't begin to tell you. Um, March is a, what Women's Month, and so um, you know, th there's no better way for me to spend my uh, Tuesday uh, before a snowstorm. <laughs> uh, at, not only at, at you know, with with all of you, but to be able to interview uh, one of my heroes uh, and a person that has done so much. Um, and has gone uh, where, where, where not many people have gone, particularly not many diverse people. So, um, so I, you know, I have an introduction, uh, we have questions, but this is really, um, this is really about her. Um, so, but let me begin. You know, I'm a member of the Weinberg Center's Advisory Board, and as Charles had said earlier this morning, I think I, I, I'm pretty sure I was from the very beginning. Um, I was very young. Um, as many of you know, one of the center's initiatives has been to focus and, uh, on and highlight board diversity. This has been accomplished thus far in many ways, in particular the center's work on board composition and director skill sets. More recently at last year's symposium, uh, Ron O'Hanley, the president and CEO of State Street, talked about State Street's then newly announced initiative regarding increasing the number of women on boards. For those of you that joined us last year, you will recall that that is also where State Street unveiled and announced their Fearless Girl statute, which was installed in New York City next to the Bull and Wall Street as a way to focus attention on this issue. How many of you actually went there to look at it? So that's where I take visitors uh, when they come to New York. I live in New York City. Also at last year's symposium, Joanne Lublin from the Wall Street Journal spoke about her book, Earning It, Hard-Won Lessons from Trailblazing Women at the Top of the Business World, which focuses on women in senior management and board positions. We're continuing the center's focus on diversity and women. However, this afternoon we will focus on women at the top of the legal profession, and more specifically, women in the Delaware judiciary. Today we are honored to have Justice Karen Vallahara with us, who is currently the only female justice on the Delaware Supreme Court. Since we are lucky to have her with us, we will also discuss some of the most recent trends and developments in Delaware law. Now let me provide some highlights of Justice Vallahara's background. The Honorable Karen Vallahara was sworn in as Justice of the Supreme Court of Delaware on Friday, July 25th, 2014. Prior to her appointment to the Supreme Court, she was a partner at Skadden, Arp, Slate, Mager, and Flom LLP, where she practiced law from 1989 until her appointment to the court in 2014. As a practicing lawyer, she was, considered, she was consistently selected for inclusion in the Chamber USA, America's Leading Lawyers for Business and the Best Lawyers in America. Recently, she was selected by the National Association of Corporate Directors to the NACD Directorship 100, honoring the most influential people in, the, in corporate governance. She is also a member of the American Law Institute. Her corporate litigation practice included complex commercial and corporate governance issues, federal and state matters, as well as M&A and other transactional litigation. Justice Vallahara served on the advisory board of the, J, of the John L. Weinberg Center for Corporate Governance and served as chair of the Delaware Supreme Court Board on Professional Responsibility and served as chair of the Delaware Supreme Court's Board on Professional Responsibility and as chair of the Delaware Supreme Court's Permanent Ethics Advisory Committee on the Delaware Rules for Professional Conduct. She also served for eight years on the Corporation Law Council of the Corporation Law Section of the Delaware State Bar Association. How do you find the time to do all this? Oh my. <laughs> Additionally, she's. Uh, she served her community as a member of the Board of Directors for the Delaware Special Olympics for 18 years, including service as that board's president and as a member of the Delaware Bar Foundation for eight years, including service as that board's president. 
Justice Valahara received her undergraduate degree from uh, Washington and Jefferson College in 1985, where she was valedictorian, and her law degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where she was a member of the Law Review. She served as a law clerk to Judge uh, Robert E. Cohen of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sir Third Circuit. So now let's begin our interview. So what first sparked your interest to pursue a career in law? Well, first of all, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh-oh. There we go. Thank you for that kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I, I just will add my, my standard caveat. I'm speaking for myself today and not be on behalf of uh, the Delaware Supreme Court. But um, I was born and raised in Western Pennsylvania, and there were no lawyers in my family. Uh, my father was a doctor. Uh, my brother went to medical school. Do aunts were nurses. And so I was kind of the outlier in um, wanting to become a lawyer. And although my mother does take credit for it because uh, when I was a toddler, she used to have me memorize things and she made me memorize uh, the preamble to the Constitution <laughs> on the 4th of July and sent me over to my neighbors with a little flag and they gave me <laughs> a piece of candy. But I, I would say I just sort of gravitated towards the law based on the courses that I like and I had some excellent teachers um, but one of the things that I was fortunate to have in my college years, and I know we've got some uh, college students here, was um, a very great advisor who pointed me in the direction of some fellowship programs in Pennsylvania state government. And I um, was selected for that for eight summers, uh, or three summers in a row during my college years. It was a group of eight students, and it was mentored by Judge Genevieve Blatt, who was the first woman elected uh, to state court in Pennsylvania. And so imagine what that was like being a college kid and having lunch every Thursday with such a, uh, a trailblazer. And I think that really helped spark my interest. What advice would you give, um, again, college students, particularly young women, um, who are looking to pursue a career in law? Well, I, again, I would say um, try to find a mentor. Try to find somebody who can help you along the way. It's a big decision these days going to law school, and especially with the job market being a little bit more constricted than it was than when I was going through school. And so it's a big investment in terms of time. And, and so I would recommend trying to find some internships just like I did. Uh, I know our courts. Um, are, are looking for interns. I hire two um, law school. I don't hire them. We don't pay them anything. But I bring on two summer interns from law school. And I know the Superior Court, for example, will bring on college level interns. So opportunities are there. And I would say try to avail yourself of some of those uh, to, to get a sense of what it is that you might be getting yourself into first. What was it like working in a large law firm? And um, do you have any advice for women who are currently at large firms and are trying to make partner? Sure. Um, when I entered um, the law firm life, it was 1989. And it was still on the heyday of the big um, takeover era. And um, there were no women partners in, in the office of Skadden Arps where I was. And so all of my mentors were men. And, um, and they were great mentors. And it was very much a meritocracy. Uh, it didn't matter really what you looked like. There was so much work to do. Um, all that mattered was were you willing to do it and could you do it well. And uh, they were also instrumental in, in trying to instill in me the value of becoming involved in, in the local community. And I think that kind of um, broadened focus is something I would suggest to um, young men and women uh, who are interested in developing their careers. Um, I think that to become a partner in a law firm today is difficult. Uh, we all know it's difficult. Uh, there are fewer spots, perhaps, than uh, there used to be. When I was a junior associate starting out, um, it, it was uh, the partnership track was probably about seven and a half years to maybe nine years to get to what was called the Skadden morning line. 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but that was morning the, line. The morning line. I think it comes morning from a, as in morning. <laughs> no, you know? I think it comes from a racing <laughs> term okay. to get to the to, to the line where you're going to be considered. And um, and so I became a partner after eight years. But as my career went on, um, the partnerships started the track started taking longer. And I think um, many firms experience that. And so one thing I would say is you have to be patient. If it's what you want to do, it may take a little bit longer than what you thought it might take. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of firms also have uh, positions, council positions and the like uh, to try to hold people in the spot until uh, there is room to advance them. I think the other reality is that if you're going to become a partner, it was my uh, sense that you really had to learn how to develop business. And because that is, that is the key, that is what uh, firms are, are looking for. And so developing those skills in, is difficult. And, uh, but I think it's, it's really um, a, a necessity if, if you're going to advance. And I think the other thing I would say is, is getting along with um, your coworkers, getting along with your staff, um, one of the things that I know a lot of big firms started doing uh, maybe seven or eight years before I left the bench was not only evaluating, having the senior people in the firm evaluate the junior people, but doing what is called 360 reviews or up, upward reviews where the junior people actually evaluate the senior people. And of course, it has to be done in a way that is anonymous and a lot of the, the firms have uh, accounting firms that, that make sure it's a, a secure um, anonymous procedure. But it's amazing how much bad behavior that controls because all of a sudden advancement decisions are taking account of how people treat one another. And if you're a person who really has difficulty working with other people, well guess what? That may be the one thing that holds you back at the end of the day. Oh, I have a story as a young associate, a, a partner was known if he, he, you didn't, he didn't get, get the right result, he would throw things. And I, as a first year associate, um, he, he, he did not like the result, it was not the research. And he threw a, a, a stapler at me. Um, so I went to talk to another partner because I, I thought this guy must have been really mentally in, on hinge. And when I, he said, did he hit you? I said, no. And he says, what's your problem? Um, because he was known. I mean, he, he, he did a lot of business. And in those days, you know, I mean, you know, you, you, I guess you learned how to duck. So, uh, <laughs> but, but one of the things I wanted to point out, I, I know being in-house, this is something that we're also very passionate about, which is um, we, 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 we want um, our outside lawyers to be diverse. Um, and the business part is very important. So, you know, we have various programs where we'll see upcoming uh, associates um, and we, we will designate them a fellow, you know, so that they really get to know our company and our business so that they, they, they can do, you know, they can bring in that business. Similarly, when we ask large firms um, to represent us, we want to know who is representing us and we want to know what percentage, you know, it, so it's not just the, the team that came to pitch you because I, I can tell you over all my years, they knew I was very passionate about, um, about diversity. So I always had diverse people, uh, lawyers coming, you know, with the group, but it's actually who's doing the work too. And, and I have to believe <laughs> that is moving the, the needle somewhat if more and more clients are, are, are feeling that way. So I uh, agree because I think bringing in business is, is just really a very important. So similarly, what is it like working as the sole female on the Delaware Supreme Court? And do you have any advice for women who may want to join you on the Supreme Court? Well, that, that's an interesting question. I, um, it, it took me a while to transition from private practice to going on the, excuse me, going on the Delaware Supreme Court because um, I was around so many people and uh, every day my brain was uh, uh, overloaded with um, the emails that, that would flood into your computer and, and private practice and, and phone calls. 
And then I went on to the court and everything was much quieter all of a sudden. And I had gone from a situation in, in the private law firm world where early on in my career I was the only woman in the room oftentimes. And then that changed greatly by 2014 when I went off. And then I went on to the Supreme Court and found myself once again <laughs> the only woman in the room. But my colleagues are, are wonderful to work with. I enjoy the dialogue. Um, it is a, b a bit more isolated um, e experience, but um, I do think diversity um, on our courts is important because I think people look at cases in different ways. And I, th and I can see that when I'm discussing cases with my colleagues. Sometimes I have a point of view about a case that is different uh, fr from their point of view. Um, as for advice, um, about somebody who might want to aspire to be on the Delaware Supreme Court. It's interesting, we had so much transition when I first got on the court. Um, our former Chief Justice retired, and then um, uh, Justice Berger retired, and then Justice Jacobs retired, and then Justice Ridgely, some of them are here today. And, and so uh, Chief Justice Strine got on the court in January 2014. That's only four years ago, and he's the most senior member of the court. I joined the court in July of 2014. I'm now the second most senior. Interesting. So um, we have 12-year terms, and so I, I think it will probably be a while before there is turnover on the court, most likely. Um, but for women who aspire, anybody who aspires, I think um, Oftentimes, people go on the Supreme Court after having served as a trial judge or directly from private practice. So I would say, uh, you know, in the meantime, if they want to serve as a judge, there may be vacancies elsewhere. I would say get a copy of the application and look at what um, our Judicial Nominating Commission looks for and, and just try to get yourself ready if, that, if that's what you want to do. As the second female in history to sit on the Delaware Supreme Court and the only current female justice, what type of role model advocate do you try to be for women across the country, not just in law, but, but the corporate world as well? Well, uh, I, I, one of the things I learned in, in taking this position is that uh, in addition to doing the core mission, which is deciding cases and, and writing opinions, there is a a public outreach aspect of it, and um, in that, in my capacity, I am invited to attend various conferences during the year, and I have to uh, limit that, obviously, so it doesn't interfere with um, doing the core mission. But uh, I do participate in certain conferences. I, for example, in November 2017, I was asked to serve on a panel of federal and state judges in the. American Bar Association's Women in Litigation Conference in Philadelphia, and the topic was uh, sort of analyzing where women are in the legal profession now. And I, I think just being present uh, in, in those forums and dealing with the topic um, is important. Uh, I attended our Women in the Law Conference uh, just this past weekend in Sussex County, Delaware, and served on a panel there. So I do try to um, participate in, in such events, and I think that helps, hopefully. Do you hope to see more gender and other types of diversity in the years to come, not only in the Delaware court system, but nationwide? And what is your view of ways to reach this goal? Um, I, I think having a court system that uh, is reflective of the population it serves is a, a desirable thing. And if I can walk us back just to talk about a little bit of historically where were we as um, women in the Delaware court system, um, a couple interesting facts I think will illustrate that we had a bit of a slow start. We were the first state to ratify. Isn't she so diplomatic? <laughs> we were the first state to ratify the U.S. Constitution, but we were the last state to admit women to the bar perhaps tied for the last state, and that was in 1923. And uh, finally, our, our Delaware Constitution was amended um, to allow women to be public officers. And my predecessor, Justice Holland, writes in his treatise um, that 
until this section of the Constitution was added, the Delaware Supreme Court apparently held that the Delaware Constitution requires state officers, including lawyers, to be men. Um, so it wasn't until 1923 that we had women. Uh, the first woman judge was Roxanna Cannon Arsht in 1971. She was the fifth member of the bar in 1941. Wow. And uh, just a couple of facts. Our Court of Chancery was created in 1792, uh, and the first woman judge was Carolyn Berger in uh, 1984, 192 years later. Um, the Superior Court was created by our Constitution in 1831, and the first woman judge was in 1988, uh, 157 years later. And the Delaware Supreme Court was created in 1776, although it was reconstituted uh, much later. And um, Justice Carolyn Berger was the first uh, 218 years later. That's what I mean by a slow start. And so you can ask, well, where are we now? Um, our Superior Court is about 33% women, with the President Judge being a woman. Um, there are one member on the Delaware Supreme Court, one member of the Court of Chancery is a woman. Our family court um, has about 65% women. So that's where we were and that's where we are. And I've forgotten your question, <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. sorry. <laughs> Um, what, what's your views to reach this goal? So we, we, we've seen all the statistics and it looks like there's progress being made. I, I think there is progress being made. Um, in Delaware, our judges are appointed, they're not elected. We have a judicial nominating commission that was established by government, Governor Pete DuPont in 1977. It consists of uh, 12 people from the state of Delaware, some are law lawyers, some are lay people. And um, presently, I think four of those members are women. Um, there's one vacancy right now. But uh, what they do is they select from uh, a pool of applicants, and it's co a confidential process, so it's ne never really clear who applies. And then they send three na names to the governor, and the governor selects a judge who is then appointed by or, or confirmed by the Senate. So it's really up to the governor uh, to, to determine uh, what his priorities are in terms of filling the bench. But um, I, th I think it's important for qualified candidates to, to stay in the race. Uh, I think women drop out of all segments of the legal profession uh, much more often than men. Well, and, and you made a very good point when we were talking uh, on the phone uh, about trying multiple times. You, you right. want to talk about that a little bit? I think um, it, it, it was interesting. The first panel we had at, on this weekend's conference uh, was the G, uh, a panel on the JNC, the, the selection process. And what I've heard from numerous people is that most judges don't make it on their first time. And it's important to try, try again. And um, I had applied to become a federal judge actually in 2001. And I made it very far along in the process, but, but didn't um, get there. And uh, it was 10 years later I tried again um, and uh, for a vice chancellor spot and didn't get it. So uh, when this vacancy came up, um, I wasn't even really thinking of applying. I was busy in practice. I was on the firm's executive committee, which was managing 24 offices worldwide, and I was chair of the firm's council committee. But um, I was asked to put my name in the hat, and first I said, ah, people are gonna think I don't wanna practice law anymore. And I, I was hesitant, and, but I finally did it. And this panel I was on, I've been on panels for Penn Law School, similar types of panels with women judges, and none of them had made it their first try or their second try. Um, and a couple made it on their third try. So, you know, there's no, I, I don't think there's any shame in, in putting your name in and not getting it. It's just uh, um, getting, everything is a learning experience if you treat it that way. And you can have somebody label something a failure, but that's their label, it doesn't have to be yours. Great advice. Um, our, our good friend Myron Steele shared his views regarding the current state of Delaware law 
and where he thinks it's going from his position as a Delaware litigator and the former Chief Justice of the Del Delaware Supreme Court. Um, could you please share your views of the current trends with respect to Delaware corp uh, corp corporate law? Sure, I, I, I'd be happy to. And first I would say, um, I, don't, I don't have an agenda. I don't pro approach cases that way. I deal with cases and, and, and try to resolve them based upon the facts before me. And um, I do agree with his, uh, his, his two trends. We'll talk about Trulia just for a minute. I remember being on um, panels. Anne would invite me to serve on the Delaware Law Update panel at the Weinberg Center. And being on panels, I think it was like 2012, 2013, 2014. And we would always talk about the cornerstone uh, statistics on lawsuits being filed in Delaware on deals over $100 million. And the statistics were always in the range of 92%, 93%, 94%. And, and the question you have to ask is, does anybody really think 95% of the boards out there are breaching their fiduciary duties in, in uh, approving transactions of $100 million or more? And I think the answer would be no. And, and Trulia, in, in my view, was essentially um, correcting something that had gotten out of balance. And I, I recall serving on panels with, you know, very highly respected members of the plaintiff's bar, um, people for whom I have a lot of respect. And, and they would say um, there are segments of the plaintiff's bar who are engaging in this fast filing and this quick disclosure process uh, and, and defendants are settling, and, and the shareholders really aren't getting much at the end of the day. It was almost being called a merger tax. And so I look at Truly as sort of a little bit of corrective steering by the Court of Chancery, and um, I agree with uh, the former Chief Justice that disclosure is very important. Another one is, is the Corwin developing line of cases dealing with um, post-closing damages um, cases and the effect of a fully informed uh, vote of disinterested stockholders in cases where entire fairness or there are not conflicts. And so that's been a developing line of cases. And I would echo his point about how disclosure is still an important feature. We decided a case, you know, very recently, the Appel versus um, Berkman case involving a, um, a situation where there was a vote on a transaction and, and the shareholder plaintiffs had obtained board minutes and the board minutes had reflected that the chairman, CEO, and a large stockholder, who was a large stockholder of the company, had, um, had made statements that this was not the time to sell the company, had made statements um, criticizing management and basically criticizing. Someone put those in the minutes? <laughs> and, and so none of that was in I'm the... I'm sorry, I'm a corporate secretary, go ahead. <laughs> none of that was in the D9, yeah, and all yeah. the D9 said was the directors voted against the transaction and the chairman abstained. And so the question was, was this material information that a shareholder would want to know in voting on the transaction and deciding whether or not to uh, seek appraisal? And the Court of Chancery dismissed the case, and we reversed, saying that is indeed uh, material information, particularly since the D9 had said that the chairman had unique knowledge of the company and an understanding uh, that, was, that was very deep. Um, another trend that we've seen on the Supreme Court, we've had a number of um, cases involving MLPs, Master Limited Partners, Partnerships, and um, alternative entity litigation is um, alive and well in Delaware, and um, a lot of people associate Delaware as a home for corporations, and I think something like 40,000 corporations were formed last year. Well, 144,000 uh, limited liability companies were formed last year, and so um, that business is, is, um, is um, sig significant, and we see a lot of those cases. Um, as well, and they tend to arise because in alternative entity law, it's not um, you know general common law principles of fiduciary duty that that, that typically um, 
are at issue in these cases, but rather contractual standards of conduct. And they typically involve a transaction that is a conflict transaction and whether or not the conflict transaction falls within a safe harbor. And so there are probably four or five of those cases um, that we've handled. We've also handled uh, a number of appraisal cases, and this is one area where I'm going to back off a little bit because we have, uh, we decided the DFC case. Um, we issued our opinion in Dell. Uh, there was no motion for re-argument or rehearing in that case. However, it is on remand. And we've got a number of appraisal cases um, coming up uh, on our docket. Um, but that is another area where um, there has been a lot of activity. And again, I, you know, I don't think there's an agenda to push the law in any direction. We deal with the cases based on the facts as we see them. I, I know some com commentators say, well, the Supreme Court is trying to, to limit the remedy to private company transactions or controller squeeze outs, but there's no, there's no preconceived agenda here, I can assure you of that. And one interesting digression on this point, from, you mentioned in your introduction that I had served on the Corporation Law Council. That is the um, entity of the Delaware Bar that does the initial drafting of the Delaware General Corporation Law. All of the amendments every year are really drafted and debated and um, put together by that commission. And uh, during the eight years I was on it, there was always a 262 appraisal subcommittee. And very little um, legislation ever really came out of it. And the reason was not that things were, things were being proposed all the time. It's just that there is a balance um, in that process where various constituents are represented. Um, and there is a sense that the law should not tip one way or the other. And so what you have is, frankly, a lot of you know, proposals driving from different directions. But at the end of the day, nothing um, significant was really proposed. Now, in 2016, I think there were a couple of amendments, the de minimis exception, saying that you had to have a certain amount of stock in order to bring a case. Um, and, <clears throat> and, excuse me, the interest um, amendment that allowed companies to stop the running of interest in these cases um, because they're expensive cases to litigate. There are very um, limited ways to try to resolve them short of trial and all the while the interest runs at 5% over the Federal Reserve discount rate. And so that created a dynamic in litigation where um, th that generated some of these pr proposals. So the point there is that there is an eye to trying to keep the law balanced and to have it develop incrementally in the case law and I, I think with a focus on narrow holdings, not trying to be any more expansive than what the facts really are, are calling for. Um, are there any other notable recent cases that you think the audience <clears throat> would be interested in? We've had, uh, we've had a couple of, of cases. One is the Investors Bank Corp case dealing with um, director compensation. I don't know if any of you have had a chance uh, to look at that. that uh, was no, a, I read it. I'm a director. That was uh, Justice uh, <laughs> Seitz. Um, but, but that one dealt with um, stockholder ratification of director compensation uh, and whether um, the, the board can invoke the business judgment rule or does entire fairness apply. And basically, the 30,000 foot view of the case is, is that um, ratification, namely stockholder ratification of uh, director compensation is available in, in two different scenarios. One, one is when the stockholders approve specific awards. And the second is when the stockholders approve a, a self-executing plan. In other words, there really is no room for exercise of director discretion. It's a formula. It's hardwired, and there's no 
room for directors uh, to, to um, exercise their discretion. There had been another group of cases developing in the Court of Chancery where there was this third category where um, stockholders would approve a, a plan that had limits and um, directors within those broad limits were voting on their own compensation. And what this case essentially says in simple terms is that in that scenario, um, the entire fairness standard is going to apply. Because I, I think in that case, I forget the exact numbers, but uh, the non-employee directors um, in 2014 were paid somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000. And then after this challenged plan was approved, they were receiving $2 million a year. And I think the average peer company was something like $175,000. And so the court looked at that and said, you know, if you're going to uh, give the directors discretion in this broad kind of range, it's going to be judged under the entire fairness standard. Any other cases that you think would be of interest? I think another um, one was uh, the Alvarez versus Walmart case, which was a case um, arising out of multi-forum litigation um, in involving Walmart. And there, there were plaintiffs who had sued in Arkansas federal court, and there were plaintiffs who had sued in Delaware Court of Chancery. And the plaintiffs in the, in the Delaware courts uh, were told by then Vi Vice Chancellor Strine that you really shouldn't rush here. You should um, conduct a books and records review before filing your complaint, get the facts. This is not an expedited case. And so the Delaware plaintiffs set off to do that. It took them about three years by the time all that litigation was done. In the, in the interim, the Arkansas plaintiffs um, had initially, had, that case had been stayed, but then it got going again. And the federal judge warned whoever decides this case first may have the effect of precluding the other case. And so that's exactly what happened. The plaintiffs in Arkansas didn't do the books and records review although they had certain books and records that they had been able to obtain through other means, uh, through a New York Times um, an investigation that was public online. And so they had certain documents. Um, but ultimately, their complaint was dismissed. And so Chancellor Bouchard then dismissed the Delaware complaint, giving the Arkansas complaint precl preclusive effect. And then it was appealed and it came to us and the issue was did that violate due process rights of the Delaware plaintiffs and our court prefers to have our trial courts thoroughly vet an issue before it comes up to us and we thought that it would be um, best to have the court of chancery focus more directly on that due process issue so we sent it back and the chancellor came back and said I would do the same thing. Uh, the weight of the case law is definitely in terms of granting uh, preclusive effect. However, I recommend that you go this other route that um, one of the other vice chancellors had gone and basically said you shouldn't really grant preclusive effect as a matter of due process unless and until a complaint survives a motion to dismiss. So it came back up to us and we said, no, you got it right the first time. Um, that uh, it was properly dismissed, but there was a, you know, almost a, um, you know, first year law school civil procedure exercise that we had to go through. But the point of it all is that the court considers um, a host of policy issues in this type of case where we've got um, to balance the interest of respecting the judgments of our sister courts we have the due process rights of the plaintiffs on this um, end over here. We have the longstanding policy of our court of encouraging plaintiffs to do a books and records review in this type of case before filing a complaint. And so it was a confluence of trying to balance all of those things and, and the opinion uh, resulted from that. 
Well, I have one final question, and I, and I just want to thank you in advance. But you had mentioned that we have college students in the room, and many of them are studying business or, or law. And um, what do you think are the key takeaways that you would like to leave them with? First of all, where are you? Uh, raise your hands. A couple over here, a couple back there. Some had to leave for class, I, I suspect. Um, I don't know, uh, when I was a student, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely stay for free lunch. I, I thought yeah, Charles yeah. made this manda mandatory. Yeah. Um, I, I would say, here's my advice to you, do whatever you do with heart. And I use the word heart um, as an acronym for um, four or five different points. You know, for the H, I would say hard work. There's no substitute for it. Do you know anybody who's reached the top of their profession, and many have here, without a lot of hard work? There's really no getting around it, I don't think. And I would say, um, you know, honesty in your dealings with others. And uh, if you've ever looked at the Delaware bar application, <laughs> you have to disclose just about everything you do. And, and it's, uh, it's, it, it really drives home that the point that everything you do counts and, and make it count. And for E, I would say um, enthusiasm and energy, like what you do. Uh, if you're not liking it, maybe you're pointing yourself not quite in the right direction. And, um, and I would add exercise, and I say that because, I say that for a reason. And here's the reason. One of the things I do administratively is I'm the liaison for Board on Professional Responsibility, Office of Disciplinary Counsel, and Delaware lawyers um, who run into trouble from time to time. And one of the things I've learned um, through all of the countless meetings I have attended through these arms of court is that there is a very scary uh, national trend for young lawyers having problems with alcohol. And I, I say that just to warn you to find healthy ways to deal with the stress that this profession inevitably has. It, is, it has become in many ways 24-7, but you have to learn how to manage it, manage it in a healthy way. The A, I would say altruism. I would say, you know, find something, some, find some way to contribute to your community. Um, our lawyers' rules of professional conduct have an aspirational um, goal for lawyers to do pro bono work, to serve the public in some way. And I think that is healthy for you. Whatever you do in the next step of your career, people are going to look at your application and see what else have you done uh, besides just focus on your schoolwork. And then R, um, I would agree, I think respect is, is the key. Um, collegiality has been thrown around, but I think respect is really where it's at. Respect the rule of law, respect the people who have helped you get where you are today and respect your fellow students and the people that you will be working with. And T, and I touched on this earlier, try, try again. And if you don't get it the first time, consider it a learning experience. How many athletes at Seoul, at, at the Winter Games, do you think would have been there if they would have thrown a towel in after the first time they lost or didn't qualify for something? So I would say stick with it, um, just like the the statue of the fearless girl that you referred to um, in the outset of your remarks. And interestingly, there's a Delaware connection. I don't know if you know this, but the sculptor who created the fearless girl um, lives in Lewis, Delaware. And uh, she opened her studio there in 1998. So she's, you know, part of our local landscape here. Justice Valley Horror, thank you so much. And what a wonderful, Feet way to, to end this. And as we said, I, I, you've got the admiration and respect and awe of everyone in this audience. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.